Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome once again to another episode of Camera and Flask. Wonderful to have you all with us. Please get involved in the chat tonight. Gentlemen, co-hosts, how are you this evening? How's your week going? What's new? Hmm. Doing well. Uh, I didn't mute something, so let me deal with that. There we go. And I can hear you guys in real time. How are you guys doing? How are you, Ben? I'm going purple today. Yeah, I I've, inspired I've, I've, by I've you. I should have mentioned that earlier. I know. I was going to make reference to your your submarine brothel thing going on, but <laughs> submarine brothel. How do you get this up? It's like DOS boot and a brothel. Yeah, uh, I don't know. You I just showed my before age. Before we went live, that yeah. it looked like I was in a brothel. It was like I was going for a submarine look. So you know, I, I guess, can guarantee you know, hybrid. There's, hybrid. I, you've, there's got to be a nightclub in Berlin called Submarine Brothel. Or Das Boot Brothel. Yeah, I, I know. Das Boot. Das Boot. I still haven't seen that movie. It's been on my Plex forever. Same. 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 I'm admitting, <laughs> even though I'm of There's the age. Red that October, too. I've seen that many, many times. Oh, yes, me too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. All right. <laughs> How about you, Jem? Yeah, you. I'm all right. You know, uh, I, was, I was telling you, gents, earlier that... <laughs> There's actually some work coming in. It's not a lot, but it's work, and it's going to help pay bills, and it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be easy, and those are good things after being where we are or have been for so long. So I'm happy about that. So my, my spirits are pretty good until tomorrow if I make the mistake of reading the news. <laughs> But I'll try to stay yeah. away from it, and then we'll be okay. So yeah, I I'm find doing fine. That is the best best way to keep your mental state in anything like a, a healthy condition is just to avoid the goddamn news. That is just yeah, sort of the, the new system. That's how it works. But saying that, I'm quite a, a little bit the same as you that I'm I'm starting a bigger project. So I'm sort of swatting at a mosquito which is flying around my head at the moment. If I'm doing this, that's what's going on. Um, yeah, the, there's a bit of work coming in. I've got. Uh, a few calls this week about some UK work. I've got uh, gigs here, which is like a one day a week for the next few weeks, starting this week. I'm terrified. I'm so I'm so nervous about going back to it. I've, I'm just I've spent a whole week just racking my brains, going like, do I remember how to do this stuff? What do I need to take? What do I need to take yeah. for a shoot? I got need a camera. What are the other thing? And normally this is just so ingrained in you. It's it's been so long since I've actually shot a proper a proper project. It's feeling. A little nervy. I'm very, very happy to be doing it, obviously, but it's, yeah. it's, things have changed, you know? Just ride the but, bicycle, yeah. then ride the bicycle. You're going to be fine. It's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, uh, it still doesn't stop me fretting about it, but no. there we are. The other thing that will help with all of this, of course, is a drink. So let's get, let's get to that. Let's start, let's start I'm expecting something exotic, given the color scheme over at Caleb. So let's save that for a minute. <laughs> Ridiculous. Let's build up to it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I think there's going to be something with an umbrella in it over there. So let's, oh, let's... <laughs> gosh. You're going to be let down, but yeah. Okay. I'm still going to build it up for a little while. So, Jim, okay. Jim, what are you drinking this week? Uh, this week, I am on my uh, second try of the Glenlivet. It is the Caribbean cask. So it's not an aged uh, whiskey. But it is aged in Caribbean casks, so uh, AKA rum casks, and it's quite lovely. It goes down smooth. I'm not. I'm not objecting to this scotch. It's fine, and it's not expensive. So there you go. Das Boot. Excellent. All right. Very so nice. so what what goes down well in the? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to make that joke. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I'm leaving it. <coughs> okay. Hit, I don't know if that's done. Oh, Knob Creek. Knob Creek. Uh, the nine Did. year. I don't oh, know if I've the nine year on the show. Oh, no, I don't think so. So, that's a first for the show. As usual, we're rocking Caleb levels. Beautiful. So let's pop this up. Although Caleb levels have been decreased significantly, I've I've been trying to. 
or increase, uh, decrease. lose weight and help my gut. So I've been drinking less and I'm now a massive lightweight. My wow. wife and I went out to dinner for the first time in what feels like six months. Yeah. Um, and, uh, got a sitter and everything. And, uh, we both had like one and a half drinks and we were done. You were by like, by like eight thirty, we were shot over. Amazing. Kaput. Well, it's amazing. That's sad, but you lose the ability, isn't it? It just yeah. Well, that's yeah. Not, that's some some of you. Uh, ben, what are you <laughs> drinking up there? Up okay, right above so me. Because, Sorry, I'm looking. Hi, hi. Um, I'm uh, tickle his head. Uh, I'm drinking tonight because I've been losing my voice a little bit this evening. I'm on tea with uh, honey and lemon in it. I'm afraid. No whiskey. Mm. Not even any whiskey. No. Mm. No, not tonight. I'm just going. I'm. That's good. You got to listen. I always say, listen to your body. So do what you got to oh, yeah. do. You know, we don't mess so around tonight, here. That's what I'm on. We don't mess around at the C47. I don't know about everywhere else, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, by the way, shout out to uh, Sky and Small Brown Fox and Pat and Daniel and who else do we have over here? We've got Jake, Jake. Bill. Um, welcome. And so there's other people here because you can just pop in the chat and say hello. We'd love to hear uh, a little hi, what you're drinking. Joe Frazy. Oh, come on. What are you doing, Small Brown Fox? King Prawn. Nice. I hope you're having a lager or something with that. What's the deal? What are uh, what's people? What are people drinking? And uh, where are you coming to us from in this fine planet of a mess that we are living in? We'd love to hear. Mm. We absolutely oh. would. And in the meantime, let's let's do a cheers. 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 This tea feels so well. Okay. Nice there pour, go. Caleb. Good job. Wow, that is a. Uh, you've got more whiskey in that glass than there's, I've got tea in this. Mug, there's but... um. There's, you know, I put some water in there, and it is a hundred proof, so it'll okay. get you. Okay. You're not careful. Yeah. I okay. went with that. I have this little flask. It's a Electrosonics flask that I got one Christmas when they did a promo, and I went to the beach with the family yesterday. We left at like three o'clock in the afternoon, and we just hang out on the beach for an hour, hour and a half, and then we went to a seafood restaurant. Um, I had a little Tomaten ten, uh, and then I no twelve, the double cask. And then when we went to the restaurant, I had a Glen Living 12, and I'm like, I said, what's, uh, you know, if the bartender's in a good mood. And the guy came back, and he came back with a, a neat pour of this much Glen Living. It's pretty good. Whoa, just say, okay. Hey now. And that was a single, 11 bucks. I felt like that was my right, win yeah. of the week, man. That was yeah. amazing. Before, before, just to rewind a second, before you got to the restaurant, you went on a family trip out to the beach, and you took whiskey with you. A flask with you. Yeah, why not? It's a beach. No, and that, that's, that's definitely that's definitely not getting into problematic territory there at all. That's great. It's perfectly healthy. Good on you. Well done. Well, right. It's not like there weren't other drivers. We went to the we went to the freezing. Sees, and he still sees no problem with it. We Zero went to the problem. freezing. Okay, so it was so first of all, it was it was my myself, my wife, my in laws, my mother and father in law. Hence, oh, okay, no the whiskey. That's it. You don't need to say anymore. We understand. That's right. And and London and London wasn't there. It was the older girl. So. It's amazing. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, <sighs> great. Okay. All right. So, so this this week's obviously huge new announcement. It's feeling very much like April. It's yeah. a very time. All the big camera announcements coming in July, which is a very strange thing. Um, so, Black Magic, when we did the show last week, and we were talking about the Canon announcements, and we referenced that we just all had the email about the uh, the press event or the the, the launch event uh, from Black Magic that was coming the following day. Now, did either of you see that coming? Have nope. any inkling that that's nope. what they were going to announce? Nope. I, I was hoping. This is going to sound really selfish, but I was really hoping it wasn't going to be a pocket part of me. And the other part was really hoping it would be mm. because that'd be awesome. But I just finished like the third update to my guide. <laughs> and right. every time they do one of these updates, Blackmagic's thrown everything at the wall. It's not like, oh, we've added this new one thing or fixed these three things. It's always like as a educator on my end, it's like they completely revamped the camera. So like, you have to redo everything. Uh, so a little a little part of me was relieved when uh, 
when yeah. it wasn't <laughs> the pocket. But uh, or like the six K being a completely different. But yeah, twelve K. Hundred percent didn't see that coming. No, I think the interesting thing with it as well, and it's just, and, and again, we referenced this in the show last week. But Black Magic's launches are the most un. <coughs> it, normally, so we're going. So we. This is pushing things way beyond what any of us were expecting, spec wise. So you would have been. You know, anyone else, you imagine their press conference that this would have been. And Black Magic is just going, oh, yeah, well, you know, we went back and then we just filmed this stuff around outside the office. And then he's like pulling that where he's got the shot and he's just coming back and back and back. And go, what? Yeah. What? 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 And he's revealing the resolutions as it's going back and back. <clears throat> 12K? Yeah. What? Man? So 12K in itself, let's start there because there's a lot to talk about with this camera and an awful lot more than the headline spec. Mm. I think. I don't know about you two, but I saw the thing and just went, well, why? Why Why would you do that? 12K, then no one needs that. No one wants that. No one's been asking for that. But there's so much more going on sort of behind that headline spec. But just when you saw that, what were your sort of initial reactions to, to 12K? Well, unlike uh, uh, just as a headline, yeah, it seems like stupid. But um, I actually had some time carved out and watched the the whole thing as they unveiled everything and what i think a lot of people on twitter completely missed is all the other stuff surrounding this 12k camera which we'll be getting into obviously yeah um so it's so much more like you said than 12k um so when you look at the entire picture it makes sense and it's exciting and completely acceptable because unlike other cameras that have high resolutions there's fewer um like a lot of cameras, if you buy an 8K camera, there's no guarantee that the non-8K options will be without consequence, right? Right, right. Um, and we'll get into all that here in a little bit. But so, uh, but the 12K itself, I think because it's along with their compressed RAW, it makes sense to me. It's like, why not? Go for it. Mm-hmm. And then the yeah. price, too. It's not like they're, you know selling a $20,000 camera. It's ridiculous. Sure. Sure. It felt like such a humble brag for sure, though. That whole video is just like, (laughs) yeah, new sensor. (laughs) But that's what I'm talking about about in the back. But that's that's, together for you. That's grand style. I mean, you know, it's it's an engineer presenting their new wares. And I don't mean that in a in a bad way. I just mean that's what they do. It's a there's a there's an underlying ex- excitement that exists there, but it's so understated and so low key, and I think that that's part of the reason we 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 kind of are impacted by it in a different way than we are with other companies. So when I watch a Black Magic event, I actually, as dry as they are. I really do find that I'm paying attention to what the product is and what the specs are, and I'm intently listening to, you know, what Grant's saying because he's not throwing out a bunch of, you know, flashy stuff. He's talking right. really about just what the capabilities are. So I was, which I, ma- I, I, do, I yeah. can really appreciate. Oh, me too, for sure. I, for sure. Yeah, and he's, I mean, he's especially. a great educator, given he he's you know an engineer at heart. Oh, there's no question. Yeah. I mean, he has a way of presenting this in a way that is dry, but it's it's interesting. And he does think about the way he's going to deliver that. You know, he, he does. He's a smart enough person. You can tell that he understands that his audience is technically minded, but they're not necessarily as technically minded as he and a lot of the people who work at Black Magic Design. Right. I mean, because no. they're they, along with a lot of other companies out there, are incredibly technically minded to the point where, you know, my head would explode if they started to talk about certain things. But for me, you yeah. know, it's really interesting because um, it really kind of surprised me the same way I thought we were going to do a 4K to 8K jump. And we really did in many ways a 4 to 6K jump or 5.9K in some of the cameras. And that's kind of what we're getting with this camera. We're saying, okay, they're, they've now developed an entire ecosystem of product line 
that's surrounding 8K. And remember, they're a broadcast company as well. They're very much a broadcast company. So similar to AJA, they are making and providing products for the television and broadcast industry. And so they have kind of their whole 8K pipeline in place for that implementation. And now what they're saying is, we're going to give you a great 8K camera that you can start to use within that pipeline, understanding that it's not about shooting 12K, it's about getting arguably, maybe, we'll see, incredible 8K and maybe even possibly even better 4K from the camera. Mm. So um, I think it's really interesting. I was excited about it because it wasn't just a 12K camera. There's years of R&D that, uh, you know, that, Caleb, you started to allude to when it came to this whole event that has so much more to do with the everything that's being presented as opposed to just the camera body and, you know, yeah. and that yeah stuff. Yep. So, well, just, just picking up on what you said about being able to get potentially amazing 8K and 4K out of that, that was the first thing that obviously... When you see a spec of 12K and knowing Blackmagic's history <clears throat> with cropping, basically, this is the thing with, if we're going to other resolutions, you can start with this huge 8K, which none of us are, are particularly used for, other than for cropping in on right now. But you know, what is the consequence of going down to these lower resolutions? And it appears with the spec of this sensor, which, I mean, let's start to talk about that, that you can do any of those things with really no ill effects by the looks of things and and this sensor is an entirely different design it's uh, it's been done in-house it's, it's their own design their own build i believe mm -hmm. um and it is going to allow you to go into all those different resolutions without any any loss in quality there's no pixel binning going on we're not having to be cropping out it's a it's a very interesting way of doing things so that to me when i got into looking at the spec was interest, instantly very interesting. Also, frame rates available to it, which I don't know if either of you have got those or the, the spec list in front of well, you. Well, the most important is, you know, 110 in, in 8 and 4K, but the rumor mm -hmm. is they're going to yeah. go up to 120 in the future. I read that in one place, which was from somebody right. who has the camera. Um, yeah, and, and then the question is, I, mean, I, I, I can run though. down through it super quick for you. 12K yeah. up to 60, yeah. 8K up to 110, 4K, one, or 4K 110. So far, everything's been full frame or full mm -hmm. sensor. Um, you can do up to 140 in certain crops on the 8K and 4K, 6K mm -hmm. and 4K, uh, Super 16 up to... I'm sorry, 4K up to 220 in Super 16. So if you're okay with massive crop, you can go pretty high, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're in the sensor game now. And, you know, we should bring that up earlier than later. And the sensor design game. And obviously a design that's clearly unique-ish. RGB, same number of red, green, and blue pixels on the sensor, as opposed to the double green that most modern sensors have because we're most sensitive to green and then the real thing which is to combat sensitivity issues these white pixels and so it's going to be really interesting to see a kind of what images you can get out of these cameras but also whether or not black magic now becomes you know in its own little way a sony i don't think travis we're going to see quantity of these cameras the same way we're going to see um, you know, Canon and Sony's right now, and on sets especially. But I think it's going to be really interesting because one of the things that this camera affords is great flexibility for 4K workflows when it comes to visual effects and special effects work. And also great for virtual reality and, you know, uh, wider kind of like higher resolution capture. So maybe this sensor becomes desirable by other companies who are trying to do specific things with their cameras and they can't get that technology from anywhere else because it's been designed by black magic so that, that could be really interesting too in terms of stuff i don't know a uh, question for you guys something i super don't know what are, are what's the competition for this camera like if i'm hmm. if i'm you know the dp on the next marvel film 
and I want to dabble in like ridiculous high resolution, what what are the alternatives? Uh, well, I don't know. Twelve. Is there? I mean, the, the, I is there a twelve K sensor camera out there that people are using? I don't there's know. Definitely, Not that I know. There's definitely eight K cameras, no, and then that's what's going to be interesting about this. And it's clearly a sensor that if they can manage the heat, which they're obviously doing partially with Black Magic Raw that they could put into a smaller camera body eventually. And then that would be really interesting for people who are working on special effects stuff, right? Because this, the size of the Ursa Mini Pro body, as it is right now, is ideal for people who want a shoulder-mounted camera and who want to put it yeah. up on a pretty beefy tripod system. But as soon as you want to, this is, this is not a camera for gimbals. This is not a camera for drones. This is not a camera for, you know, crash cams and, and to tuck into small, tiny places. So, uh, you know, but the fact that they have the sensor and it's working and they have the whole workflow, that means um, we're going to be able to see some really interesting things. Do they even skip the 6K pocket camera and make a 12K pocket camera? I mean, you don't know. Oh, no. You, well, you say no, but the sensor exists now. So maybe they put the same sensor into a pocket camera, but they just start with the resolution of 8K, and they just say, you know, it's 8 and it's 4. You can choose 6 yeah. if you want. I mean, they have a lot of flexibility, I think eight, potentially. I think 8 is a possibility. 12 in the pocket's not happening. Did you hear the camera when he turned it on? No. <laughs> so it's going to need some space, that, that 12K. It's going to yeah. need some room to uh, but, dissipate but, heat. But by yeah. my concern about the camera is that, you know, in order to, again, combat the, the issues having to do with light gathering, they've had to put in all of these white pixels because they have these even RGB and however they're – and, and the, the pixel size is, is really tiny. So maybe they go with a totally different – sensor design on a pocket camera sensor but the fact is that they they're designing sensors now so if they're designing yeah, sensors then maybe they they change that and then the pitch is bigger for the 8k pocket camera and there'll be different advantages to that camera the question is whether or not now with what is a pretty dramatic shift we see Blackmagic starting to push their cameras as Blackmagic RAW cameras only because at the moment, this camera only records in Blackmagic RAW or do we still see right. the flexibility in future cameras where we can choose other formats like ProRes and record in those inside of the cameras? Um, so, yeah. uh, the, the, which is another interesting point. Caleb, you were just asking a minute ago about you know, what's the competition for this camera? What else is there around that's shooting 12K? Well, there isn't. And I don't think, really, that there's any other camera company right now that could, that could implement that, purely because of Blackmagic having this entire workflow through with their own RAW mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. their RAW system. So for those of you that, that sort of haven't looked at the spec sheet, it doesn't record in anything other than uh, Blackmagic RAW. That's what it right. does. So you're, and because they're doing that, and then they're not that they're not having to, um, to debear and transcode everything in in camera, then you're you're able to do a lot more with it in terms of this heat generation thing, but also in terms of the post workflow as well. Because if, I don't know what else is going to be able to support this initially, but obviously mm. you've got that whole resolve workflow. So you've got this this complete end to end system. So I don't I don't know about what you two think, but. I can't think of another company that would be able to sort of implement that with the way things are right now, just in terms of being able to, to deal with You're right. files of that size without making enormous cameras. Blackmagic is, is starting down a road of, they're, they're going pro, man. If you think about it, um, they, you're right, they own the whole workflow. And it's not just a workflow, it is a great workflow. It is. Like, as far as a camera being backed by a, a really solid workflow, I mean, they've got Resolve. Blackmagic Raw is phenomenal, the tech behind that. Um, so it's it's really, really interesting. And he mentioned multiple times this camera is a pro camera. Mm -hmm. They're going after the pro market, which yep. I don't, I'm not as familiar as you two are with that market and the, the pricing. 
But I feel like ten grand is pretty low. Yeah, and it's, well, maybe you've got what this you, you got offering. yeah. I mean, everybody's going to add the bits and bobs on there, like the EVF. They're going to add the shoulder mount kit, but we're still talking twenty five hundred dollars to build that camera to something that you can hop onto your shoulder and start shooting with. You know, this is not an autofocus camera. It comes PL mount standard. There will be an EF mount option. They're not playing the AF game, which is clearly something that, you know, both Sony and Canon are doing. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see where Panasonic <clears throat> goes because, you know, historically in the broadcast world, Panasonic is big on AF, but they've made decisions with their large sensor cameras not to do too much in the autofocus world. I think to compete an EVA 2 really needs to have a strong AF system when Canon comes up with, I mean, sorry, Panasonic comes out with the successor to the EVA 1. That's just me personally. But if I look at the market right now and who their audience is for using a camera like that, they're going to have a harder time competing now that you have Komodo, you have this camera and some other stuff, and saying that the EVA 1 is your cinema camera and I think that they're going to have to make sure that that second version of that camera can compete well with the C300 Mark III and with an FX9 in order to really, you know, to get sales and to get that camera into people's hands. That's me. I'm just saying. No, I yeah. agree. And I think it, it's a strange, those, that segment of the market, it's quite interesting. You know, once you go to the red and you, people uh, t in the chat talking about you know, it's into that red space but you know, it's it's there's a bit of quite a lot of brand loyalty particularly with red i mean it's it's a, quite a tribal group the the red owners as anyone who's been on certain forums will know but it's i think as a brand it's kind of quite hard to to break into that market and particularly because the way that their initial camera releases over the last what five years? How long ago is it since the first their first camera, the little pocket, came Which out? Which one? Six. The, the first the, pocket, the Super Sixteen one. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably about five years. I'm gonna say, probably. Maybe a little more. Maybe six. Well, I think it was my it, first the pocket movie. wasn't first. Like wait, 20, pocket. Uh, it's wait. going back to me. 2013. But wait, yeah, Caleb, it was Caleb. It wasn't the pocket that came first. It was the um, wasn't it? Wasn't the two point five K came first? Well, or was it there pocket? Was the, there was Sorry, the, yeah, the, yes, there the, was the cinema camera. Then there was yeah. the pocket. The year before, I think. Then the four K. Then they started doing right. the micro. But my two right. favorite sensors right. uh, <clears throat> were always the two point five K and the and the pocket. I loved the look of those two cameras. Even mm. though the battery only lasted for about three minutes on the the original pocket right. camera, right? So, so this is exactly what I'm getting at: is that through all that, that's kind of initial and very kind of bold steps that they took into the into being a camera producer, that there was an awful lot of issues with them. And I I think in terms of you know when you're then competing against someone like Red or you're competing against Canon with the C series cameras, which is obviously it. This thing that it doesn't really sit into any of those groupings. It's it's a very much a unique product. That that history of stuff and that history or that kind of initial uh, issues with maybe reliability, with overheating, with poor battery life. There was always and not not with more recent ones, but there's been a lot of those issues that I think um, uh, turned a lot of people off. And that's a higher end brand initially, which I think is you know things have definitely changed on that front now. Yep. But it's it's a hard nut to crack. It's real. I mean, I was reading um, the the uh, news shooter article on it, <laughs> and they were trying to figure out in that article as to you know where it's it, who's it for, and I the same just can't really quite figure out where it sits within it. Yeah, it's a fantastically interesting product. It's something I would love to use on jobs and, and play with, but I you know would I buy it right now? No. Mm. It doesn't quite fit into things, but I think it's fascinating to see how it does. Well, I mean, Travis I mean, makes a, a good comment. He says, do we, need, do we need to start worrying about lenses that can resolve at 12K? Yeah, probably. Yes. Um, and, you know, you also have to think about the whole ecosystem here that Caleb's talking about. 
And with this being a Blackmagic RAW camera, while there is Blackmagic RAW support outside of Resolve, it's not every solution. Final Cut Pro 10 is obviously one that is not supporting Blackmagic RAW. So you're making very obvious decisions, either as a shooter or more importantly and critically with a production where you have to talk about the post workflow and make sure that people are comfortable with that being the workflow that they're going to be using. Because I don't think it's probably the same experience if you're taking Blackmagic RAW and you're using a plugin in Premiere than it is God, working I'm... directly inside of Resolve. And, you know, it's tuned yeah. for, it's, a, it's an Apple mentality there. But there's some really interesting things. And I think beyond that, I just don't want to not mention it. One of the other announcements was the Ultra Studio 3G Thunderbolt 3 boxes, which are not, oddly enough, for, uh, even 4K, but you can do 1080p monitoring from your MacBook Pro now to, you know, to, uh, you know, to an external monitor. Um, and you can basically do a, at least an HD HDR workflow, which is really interesting. So if you took that Thunderbolt 3 Ultra Studio monitor device for 115 bucks and you hooked that up to a Flanders Scientific monitor, you would have a really nice, even though it wouldn't be 4K, you would have a really nice grading solution that you could do right off of a laptop. So, so many announcements, you know, and if you start at the beginning of this whole mess and think about what we've gone through with A10 Mini, A10 Mini Pro, and then we start to move through this, they are absolutely killing it this year in terms of products. Yeah. And they are mm -hmm. just firing on all cylinders. And I'm telling you, Grant and that team, they are not going to let up. I think we've got another year, year and a half of this where they're just going to just keep banging these products out and they're going to keep killing it. There's going to be a 4K monitoring solution. It'll probably be four or $500. And then, you know, you don't have to spend a thousand because they have one for a thousand dollars. And then they'll just keep doing this. It's, I mean, you know, yep. they're in the game. Yep. They're yep. so in the game right now, for sure. Two two things we've talked about that I thought would be interesting to flesh out very briefly. Mm. Uh, you talked about like their lineup of products. Do you think the this is one of the things we could talk about? But it'd be really interesting if they ever came out with like a production monitor. Wouldn't that be pretty baller? Mm -hmm. They did like mm -hmm. a 17, mm -hmm. 24 inch. Um, and then you were talking about like the workflow and all this kind of thing. Again, I I think because it's marketed at the pro market. All the stuff that we're going to be like, I don't know about this, the pros don't care, right? Like, again, if, if you're doing a Marvel movie or something where you need resolution, crazy yep. amounts of resolution, yep. um, you, don't, you don't care at all. You don't mind at all working with Resolve, going through the what would be painful for us, data management. Like, to them, that's not a problem. Yeah, but, um, you know, Shane Hurlbut's going to do it, but a lot of other productions sure. aren't because – you know, he's got the balls and he's like, you know, I'm going to try it and I'll just throw this camera yeah. into the mix of everything else. But most people are either almost always in an airy workflow camera wise yeah. or Sony Venice and then red. So those are sort of the three, the three companies yeah. that are filling out the, the higher end of the market. And then of course, yeah. you know, the other cameras are trying to get a little piece of the pie, you know, um, including mm -hmm. Canon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why they went so crazy with this camera, mm -hmm. because it's it's actually it's a lot like the Tesla truck. <laughs> it, you you have to go yeah, so yeah. wild, yeah, because you're not going to compete with F-150s from Ford or Chevy, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is Black Magic's like, let's go crazy. Where like, you know, it's not Canon, no, it's not Airy, but it's 12K, boys and girls. Yeah, you know. So if you want the most flexibility. I don't know. It's 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 very interesting. Um, yeah, man. Regardless, hmm. Black Magic is getting it done for sure. We're not messing around. I mean, you know, they are just. I mean, and and if they've got all these products coming out, and they've been working on all of this, there's no question in my mind that we've got more stuff coming down the line, and and pretty quickly. Because if you're the type of company that they are, which I think they are, they can adapt somewhat quickly and they just go for it. 
you know. Um, and there's mm-hmm. other companies like that. I mean, you know, I think that Atomos has a, a very different but similar mentality. They go after the market that they, they see is available to them, and they really, you know, try to just start putting products into there, even though we still don't have a 4K Ninja Star, but I won't be bitter about hmm. that until the end of time. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, please get that done. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Well, coming back to, to workflow, so the first thing, obviously, that, that, or one of the, the first things that come to mind, you see the big headline of the 12K thing is, is storage. What are you going to do with all this stuff? So it's very flexible in terms of the Blackmagic Raw, in terms of the, the compression levels that you could put on that. So you can go for consistent quality or you can go for consistent data rates with it. It's kind of very interesting. And if you, uh, as we talk about grants, ability to explain things in a, a very um, straightforward way. His video explaining Blackmagic Raw when it was launched, whenever that was, a couple of last year or the year before, yep. is well worth a, a look just to, to explain how that differs completely from everything else out there uh, and how this how this works and how it is going to allow smaller, f- smaller file sizes so that you are actually going to be able to get a few minutes worth on a card. But the, the module I found was quite interesting on this. But so in terms of media, it has CFast, full-size CFast cards mm-hmm. that we all have floating around. We don't have to go to CFast Express like Canon are making us do. And it has some SD, which obviously not all not all resolutions and not all levels of compression are available on SD. But they also have a module which bolts onto the back, which runs two and a half inch SSDs. Right. And I can't remember. I think everything's available through that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but you can also you can also record to USB C drives too. I mean, in the in the presentation, yeah. you just took a little USB C drive and you just plugged it into the back, which of is the thing. super cool. Super it cool. It's crazy. Uh, and one thing I and and I'm not as familiar with this camera, but uh, I feel like on the pro level. It's just expected that things are difficult. And you just have to use the one annoying thing that the manufacturer supplies you. Yeah. Like I was watching the video the other day by Wandering DP where he was talking about the LF camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, he's like, it's got three more buttons on the side. That's amazing. You can program <laughs> three of those buttons to do things. <laughs> Whereas like Black Magic's like Super Pro 12K camera. Sure. You can plug a Samsung T5 into it if you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here's the module if you want to use it. You don't have to, but you can. Instead of being like, you got to use our caddy with our thing and our proprietary whatever. Which that's love. kind of that. That kind of harks back to what we were talking about earlier. And I exactly, I love all of that. But when you're getting to, you know, where does this fit in with everything else? And are we going into that? We wanting to get into that really high end stuff. And when you look at the way that Ari price stuff and price accessories, and then you look what that is. It's a, for the for the mounts, we were talking about this comes with PL mount as standard. They do an EF mount. I don't know if you saw the price on that. That's one hundred and seventy five dollars right. for the EF mount. It's just right. ridiculous. The EVF <laughs> is the EVF's very good, and but that's only like fifteen hundred, I think. Yeah, I was just gonna look that up because like that's a pretty solid EVF. Like, that's, all... like like gaff gaff tape cost per minute on a big set versus like the EF mount is absurd. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel said, "Did someone just fart? What did we? Did we? Did somebody go like this? I don't know what's going on. My nose is itchy today. If that's what you're referring to, but I don't know what is going on. I have no on, idea Daniel. what you mean. What is with the fart comment? You know what's really exciting is that what is going on with these things? Okay, so what's really exciting is that." You remember about four or five years ago, we started to see people even, I mean, you know, Andrew Kramer, of course, but there's other people where people just started to do ridiculous special effects outside of the Hollywood system. And what's really exciting about this camera is that for $10,000 US, you know, somebody's going to get a hold of this thing and they're just going to go bonkers with this camera. They're going to have you know, mad After Effects skills or whatever else they're going to do from a compositing standpoint. They're going to get all of that resolution. And there's just going to be ridiculous stuff that people are going to create with it. And I think when we have conversations like the one we're having about this camera, we have to we have to liken this in some respects to the conversations we have about things like Final Cut Pro. They're not necessarily 
solutions that are designed for the standard ecosystem or the industry that we think they're necessarily geared towards. Grant can say all day long that this is for the professional market. This is for this is for you know younger filmmakers who have incredible talent, who are going to get a hold of this product, but you're not going to walk onto most film sets and see anything other than an Alexa camera or a Red Monstro or a Sony Venice. Those are the cameras that are going to be the workhorses, and that's what the entire ecosystem of those productions are designed around for your entire camera department. But this camera is going to be exciting along with whatever else they come out with in the pocket camera market because it's going to just allow a whole new level of creativity for people when they're creating, you know, stories and content. That's my opinion. And there's no whoopee cushion, but I can, I could muster up a fart if you need me to. I don't know. That's kind of oh, weird. Gosh. I, I'm just saying it's kind of getting weird over there. All right, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the other, the other market, so it's definitely the indie market that, which has always been um, you know, very much an adopter of the Black Magic product, but I kind of see this as being a specialist rental as well. I and mean, I think that, that you're talking about for effects and things where you're needing that huge resolution. There's definitely certain applications where that would be really useful. So I would see it being quite a popular camera, probably more so than anything else they've brought out as a rental. Hmm. I, was, I did a job in uh, February this year that it was for a, a huge display screen and it had to be shot um it was a kind of jellyfish that i had to shoot uh in vertical video but it had to be 8k and they would have, if they could have got anything with higher resolution they'd have taken it so that's an ideal you know use of, of that and i think that there's there's certain certain applications where it's going to be very popular yeah. as, as a rental yeah, I wish I wish I could sit down with Grant and have many many drinks and get him to open up about like. Do you think they at one point were like, let's do cinema, and and kind of not shift away from broadcast, but they're clearly going after more than broadcast at this point. Um, yeah, with this with this camera. Yeah, it'd yeah. be very interesting to hear like you know, kind of what their goals are. Well, I mean, I think it, there's another thing yeah. we need to keep them. Sorry, let me finish. No, no, go, uh, yeah. Another thing to keep in mind is, uh, they've, they've been doing this for less than 10 years. Like yeah. they're really new to this. And it, at, at this point we're what generation three, maybe, uh, into cameras from like the first boxy, awful, but amazing at the same time, you know, uh, black magic cinema camera. To where we are today, that's kind of crazy. I mean, from zero to sixty with the uh, with now they're doing um, sensors, sensor design. Like that's what a humble brag. Like so low key is like, yeah, we're making sensors now. Yeah, that's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there I mean, is. don't don't you think that the the fork in the road was Resolve for Black Magic? Because if you look at them yeah. as a company. Prior to that acquisition, and and look, they've I give them all the credit in the world. There's so many times historically where a company has bought a solution, they brought it in house, and it has failed miserably. It's just you know gone to crap. And Blackmagic took on Resolve, and they really went they really went for it like all the way and the cameras are mm. the marriage between that solution because resolve and everything that's sitting inside of that box has almost nothing if nothing to do with the broadcast uh, broadcast industry so you know that is really sort of the you know if you talk they don't own the computers but in terms of the ecosystem there the marriage between hardware and software is becoming even more clear with this camera than ever before this is sort of their, you know, it's almost like Blackmagic Raw is their OS. It's like, you know, in order to work with this camera, you need to have, you know, it's, we got this format and it goes in or maybe resolves the OS. I don't know what it is, but it's it's definitely becoming a real ecosystem that they're pushing hard. So I don't know. And it, I it's, think it's interesting. It, it, it's an interesting point about Resolve and that whether that is, 
in some ways like a it's a, the gateway into black magic as a brand and as a company in in a sort of a similar way to the iphone was because so many people have got pissed off with adobe over recent years uh, for the <laughs> premiere crashing left right and center although it's pretty stable right now but it and has been the, sort of the last two versions but and them going over to that pricing model we know we onto the monthly subscription and there being no other way around that mm-hmm. and that being you know, fairly expensive if for you know if, you, if you're a small independent it's quite a lot of money per month yeah to then having that incredibly powerful piece of software which is just unbelievable it, it's it's incredible and that becoming a very very competent editing tool now which it was it was you know basically editing functions and it was primarily uh, a grading uh, tool but it's, it's an awful lot of people have transitioned over to that that's i can't remember how much the studio version is now is it a couple hundred dollars three hundred dollars the, the I mean, free yeah, version it's, it's, it's not any more expensive than like final cut yeah, it's very like no, it's ridiculous power, and included in every cam- with every <clears throat> camera that they sell, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, they're um, definitely kind of doing that, like that mm. Apple Grid move. Remember when Steve Jobs rolled out the like pro pro desktop, pro laptop, consumer mm-hmm. desktop, consumer laptop. Yeah, uh, they've got they've got all levels of cameras. Yep, the same software which can be had for free or three hundred dollars. Um, the way the cameras work with the software, they control that whole ecosystem. Yep. Uh, and then on the broadcast side, they have a gazillion, you know, switching boxes or switchers, uh, conversion boxes, capture, playback. Uh, it's crazy. Yep. I have, mm. I have a question, two questions. Number one, um, which I haven't read about, are there, was there any discussion about anamorphic workflows with this new camera? And then number two, and this is totally going in an opposite direction, but really should have been the first question related to what you're talking about, Caleb. Do we think that Blackmagic now needs to have a resolve light? Because what's inside of that box is so overwhelming to many people when they open it now. Is there something where they could have a gateway drug? I mean, it's free, so it's not about a cost right now. But is there something that they could say, okay, you're going to a pocket camera and we have two versions of Resolve. One is the whole thing. You can get, you know, the UHD version or you can pay for the other one. Or you can just go in here and what we'll do is we'll allow you to have a workflow here. Um, I don't know. Or maybe a switch inside the app where you can say, I want to be in a basic mode or in an advanced mode so that you're not overwhelmed by so many Mm. choices when you're working inside of the app. Because I think that there is definitely, you know, a a situation now when I open it and I look at it and I go, holy crap, like, where do I start? Um, (laughs) You know, now, especially now that they have all the audio stuff in there as well, which is great. But it's just so many things. And now they have the what they call the cut room, which I think is great for fast cutting and all of that. It is. It's It's just so much stuff. It's just really um, a lot. So I'm sorry. Those are two separate things. Maybe the anamorphic one can be answered quickly, but I don't know what people's thoughts are. And then I think we should also, you know, get into the chat a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, Anamorphic is quick. Go on. It's up to 8K anamorphic. Got it. Have, uh, at least that I saw. There's 8K anamorphic modes. Okay. <clears throat> and on the resolve front, uh, they have, I think they've recognized that. And I think particularly from um, trying to get people over from the Adobe workflow, and particularly what the way that the Lumetri um, system works within Premiere. So if you're used to using Lightroom, which is a lot of those people who have a photographic background that would be used to using Lightroom, and that workflow is very good. You start at the top with your white balance and you basically work your way down. Uh, and they then implemented that with the Lumetri thing. And Blackmagic do have a window which sort of mimics that, that they were trying to make it a much more simple work for using terms which are more from the photographic side of things rather than mm. from color um of terminology which i think helps but i think that's a great idea jim i think even taking that to a point where you've got all that enormous power under the hood as a as a color engine because i think as you can 
get the thing set up, you can set it so that it'll use um, Premiere or Final Cut shortcuts for the most part. Obviously, it doesn't work in exactly the same way, but it gets it gets you on your way fairly quickly. Mm. Um, but having something, for example, like Film Convert built into it, you know, if they had like a simplified version that we just go like, just pull this up the footage in, do your basic primaries on it with these sliders here in the same way, and then make it look like this film stock, this film stock, this film stock out the other end. I know they, they, there's a plug-in for that, but having that built into that level of simplicity for that end of the market, I think would be a, a huge um, plus to get people to transition to use that software. Yeah. Because it is intimidating. When you, when you go into the color window and you start looking at the node trees and figuring all that out, and it's actually very straightforward when someone explains it to you and you go on, you go on there's a million and one tutorials, obviously. Um, but, but it is daunting when you look at it. It, and it, if you're coming from those other NLEs and you come into that, it's not a familiar thing to look at. It takes mm. a little bit of getting your head around it. Mm. So, good point. Mm. All right. Uh, in in the chat, just want to say, uh, Frosty Flake, I haven't seen you here before. Good to see you. Jem, you attract Welcome. the strangest names. I love it. <laughs> we got Shiz. We got, we got uh, Frosty Flake. Where's Grumpy Penguin? I don't know, but, you know. We haven't seen him in a while. Small brown fox. It's just some shiz. It's a really interesting name. So yeah, welcome, Frosty Flake. There was something that had been mentioned a couple of times in the comments, which we've we've not talked about. Were you surprised that they did this um, and this huge spec with and not doing it in full frame or even at a lower res in full frame rather than Super Thirty Five? Uh. Personally, no. I mean, I think that your lens compa- compatibility is much broader when you go Super 35. Um, maybe there was a benefit to go full frame in terms of light gathering, but the jury's out. We don't know until this camera actually is released what we're really going to get. There's some test footage you can download, you know, um, from the stuff I've seen, it looks great. But if you put a Fisher Price camera in the hands of somebody who knows how to light and knows how to compose and knows how to move a camera, you can have some great looking images. So I think, you know, I'm not surprised that they went super 35 is basically my answer to that. And, you know, they can always go full frame when they want to, but you know, big splashes into huge splashes. Maybe that's their way. Cause this was a big splash for sure. This is one of the biggest moves since, like, the first camera. Like, yeah, you mean, I like, agree. the brownie from Kodak? Oh, you mean their first camera? <laughs> no, not the first ever oh. camera. <laughs> it's like uh, the like camera. first camera was like, whoa, yeah. they're making cameras now? Yeah. And then they, I would say, the Pocket was kind of cool, but then the Pocket 4K was a big move. Yeah. Uh, but this one is huge for them. Yeah. Yeah, and there's yeah. questions, and there's a discussion going on with New Shooter about PL glass covering full frame or not. I mean, the vast majority of PL mount lenses until recently were designed and were made for super 35 millimeter yeah, absolutely. film and for sensors. So, I mean, we have a ton of full frame glass out there, but a, a large percentage of it is still for stills application being used in video. And we're seeing that change over happening for sure. And I think Venus Optics coming to the mix and, you know, the Laua line is definitely helping with that as well. And, and a lot of other companies, obviously Sigma, um, Zeiss has been in the game for a long time in terms of, you know, lenses that can resolve to high, resol- uh, high re- uh, you know, resolutions and, and, uh, and stuff like that. But I think... I still think it's a smart move to go Super 35. I mean, I still think that the C300 Mark III will outsell the C500 Mark II, and it's not just because of the price point. I think it's just a more flexible ca- camera for day-in, day-out usage, um, personally. Yeah. And then, and, and like, on that... Go ahead. What, what, Caleb? No, it's okay. Carry on. I was just going to say, and there's so many people that their bread and butter is Super 35, and they're just used to it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're comfortable with it. They, they're they used to it, so. Yeah, I mean, it just gives you a, a far greater degree of flexibility. And then there is an adapter, um, that, like a, a speed booster, going to be available for it, I believe, which is going to allow you to 
use lenses in that sort of full frame oh. look to, uh, uh, to a full one, no, no, no crop factor at all on it, which is uh, the look adapters. Magic booster it is called, I believe. Interesting. That's a new sheeters article. Mm. Was a little bit about that, so have a look at that. But that, that to me is a very interesting product. And there's no um, optical. There's no OLP. There's no optical low pass filter on not. this camera either, which will be interesting. But there are That's a standard or for is, magic. Yeah, the, but there's a third party solution over there. So we'll have to see what happens with Chroma. Uh, capture with that camera but you know that's all the fun of the next month is seeing these camera this camera come to market and seeing people shoot with it and seeing what you know they're amazed by with the camera and then also what uh you know what surprises are going to come up so yeah yeah i'd love to have a go with one really like to have a play yeah but then so and that's not the end of the big announcement for this strange summer of uh, new stuff, there is the very, 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 very long awaited <laughs> new release from Sony coming, I believe, before next week's show. Tuesday, is it? Unicorn Day. Unicorn Tuesday, Day. July 28th, yeah. aka Unicorn Day. All right. So, what are just quickly before we finish, we've got four minutes left. Quick predictions for what we think is going to be in that. I don't know, man. I mean, the rumors are starting to kind of fill out. Mm -hmm. But from from the get-go, because Sony has waited so long, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, if, if they had released earlier, maybe we would have kind of had an idea. But because there's been so many cameras to come out, there's a lot for them to react to. It's tricky, yep. real tricky. So, I mean, you've got the S. They have, they know what. Else, what are the cameras left to come out before Sony is literally the last <laughs> camera in this generation? That's true. We've got the S one H. We've got like multiple Canons now. Which, holy cow, there's Canon cameras that don't suck. Um, <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. So I have no idea. No but what I what I'm really fascinated by are the people at Sony. Are they sitting there this week, kind of with their like Blofeld style, sitting with a cat on, cackling to themselves that they've got this in the bag and all these camera announcements that have been made and they've they're going to trounce them all, or are they sitting in a corner crying because? Yeah, <laughs> I, th I think I think they're in between. between. They can they can yeah, yeah they they can make some moves. I think what I do think that they are going to push hard on. Because they have some kind of cooling system, yeah. which the S1H has too, yeah. so it's not like mm -hmm. new. But they're going to hammer on that. I don't yeah. think they're. I don't think they care about the S1. They're yeah. concerned about Canon. So if they don't have AK, that's going to be a thing. But they're going to drive home heat, dissipation, yeah. uh, yeah. record yeah. times. Yep, they're yeah. really going to work on that. If, and, if they, yeah. You know, First yeah. ten bit, first ten bit mirrorless from them. Where where's that four, where's that four K image coming from? Is it derived from a higher resolution? Number one, uh, number two. Which it will be. What's the what's the color science? Because they need to hammer hard on that, right? Because everybody knows that yeah. Canon makes pretty pictures with their color science. And this has been the bane of Sony's existence. And it's always been, you know, like, oh, yeah, we now have a, a beautiful skin tone thing. But guess what? It's not actually log with wide gamut and you can apply a LUT to get it. It's just some special mode inside of the camera, right? So that's number two. Um, high data rate options with 10-bit 422 for sure. And are we going to get raw? If we get raw out of that camera, um, that could be really interesting. But there will be they, no yeah. question. There will be HDMI raw out. Yeah, There's and then no question. And then if they if they can work out the heat issues, if they can say, "Here's a 4K camera that you can run all day long," and they give you 4K 120, it's a home run. And then what's this, you know, CF Express Type A cards that, you know, are tiny. You will what? I'm ready. Listen. Uh, I, I, I'm curious because Gem and I have talked extensively about this. Hmm. Uh, if you read the fine print on Sony's quick guide on any mirrorless camera they make, there's a bullet point under S-Log 
that says this yeah, actually is an S log. We're just kind of gamut. BSing our way. Hey, well, no, this. it's re- it's a gamut one. It's the real one that they're BSing, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, it's not like they can't put S log, true S log, on that camera. It's like this like emulation mode almost. Yes. Mm-hmm. So will so it's completely fake. That's why it's in point five. It's in point S- five point type. It's not even a one point yeah, type. Yeah. Yeah. With like six asterisks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you anyone who shot on a mirrorless camera in S log, you go to a cinema camera and it's a completely different experience. Yes. Um, so will this be excuse me, I'm literally getting stomping above me. Will this be the first ever <laughs> Sony mirrorless camera that doesn't BS us and gives us like proper log, proper gamma? Which I hope I would really hope they do, but yes, it'll S be gamut really three, interesting. S gamut three dot cine, S gamut three dot cine, or some new version uh, and some new color profile that they put inside of there that you can have a, a LUT workflow. I mean, they have a lot of that doesn't options fall to pieces. That doesn't fall to pieces, yeah. and you know, will there be IBIS? Can they pull a hat trick and then? have some sort of ND solution inside of there. That would be bonkers. Somebody mentioned that in the well, chat. If it's going to be anyone, it'll be Sony. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they don't need as much space for their system as everyone else does. I, I just hope there's as, one or what? two. I missed that. What? Uh, need as much space for what? What, the ND physically, variable? Because, yeah. Oh, yeah, right because it, with yeah. the electronic ND, without having to have physical filters flying around in there. But it's years. Um, but it's as, been years. As, there could be advancements in it. That. Has Maybe they years. can put it. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what you should to saying in the in the chat exactly that, and what we were saying last week is that it doesn't really necessarily. Mean, it's it's got to match up with Sony's other cameras and be used be used as a B cam. That's what it's got. I don't see them being as direct competitors to an extent. For someone new into that that kind of. Um, system but we're all invested in glass we're all invested in a system so canon have come out and the great those of us have got canon glass that's an easy sell but sony if you're into that system it's unlikely that you're going to go canon if the things are comparable and yeah. the yeah. 8k and the raw i'm not sure that's as important the unicorn no. and the r5 are going head to head this is going to be a battle let me tell you kids make no mistake about it when we're talking about what cameras are going against what cameras the canon r5 and the a7s3 are the two cameras they're both going to have ridiculous af systems so that handles a big checkbox for a lot of people and the one feather in Sony's cap is you can adapt virtually any lens to that E mount, and you cannot. Uh, well, RF is very adaptable now. No, R- RF is. You can't put E mount yeah. lenses on RF, yeah. can you? Can you? Or, Which one's a yeah, shorter flange? Uh, not Has it really. ever been done? Not really. <laughs> not really. Is it possible? I mean, no, no. These the current like newer Z mount, RF mount, and E mount. Yeah, you can't really swap around. You can right. go to Z mount from E mount, but who wants to do that? But you can do. But you can no definitely offense, do. E, also, you can definitely do EF to RF, of course. But you can also do EF to E, and it's been done for ages. Yeah. So Sony, if Sony gets enough right with this camera, then it will be really interesting to see between those two. I think. I think this is not uh, about the A seven S versus R five. Hmm. This is, um, I think the A7S is going to be matching the R5 or slightly below in some specs above in others. Hmm. But we got to keep in mind the A7 III, that was in 2018, yeah. which in Sony years is like 10 years ago. That's true. Hmm. When it comes to cameras. That's true. So they could come around, they could come out with an A7 IV. Yes. That all they have to do is like 4K60 and they're done. Yeah. You know, so interesting. Uh, who knows? Who knows though? Who knows? Hmm. It's gonna be fun. Next week, next week. Next week will be very heated. We're gonna be lots of opinions, yeah. especially about the R5 versus the A7 S3. I think everybody should take a look at that S1H as well because I think that that's in that whole mix of three cameras, not with sure. AF system, but just in terms of capabilities and. uh 
Yeah, what is the R5 called film kit? If the A7S3 is called the Unicorn, we'll call it Neo. Let's tip our hat to the only Matrix movie that matters, and we'll call the R5 Neo, and we'll call the A7S3 the Unicorn. All right. And on that, some of us need to get to bed. So, <laughs> gents, final words before we depart. <laughs> I don't know, but 360 grad is now uh, is is chatting to new shooter in I think oh, Japanese. Yeah. I don't know what's going Amazing. on. Amazing, what's going on here? Amazing. <sighs> Thank you, gentlemen, for the lively chat today. And uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on with Chris's comment, but I'll, I'll go with it. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> ASMR, oh. but it has to be. It has to Asthma. be a rival themed. Asthma. Asthma is what they're saying because it all goes back to the whoopee cushion and the fart comments. You know, there's some God. kids in there's some kids God. inside of this thing. It's basically a, a chat yeah. with a bunch of uh, college people, I guess. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Pleasure having uh, my, everybody my here. My parting words right, yeah. if 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 the if the camera prices that we're talking about seem too insane. Just think five, ten years from now, how ridiculous it's going to be. The used market is going to be loaded with so many good options. Uh, I can just, you know, I won't have to think about content for like a decade at that point. I just picked up an R5. <laughs> I just picked up a, an R5 used on eBay for uh, $1,200, you know? Exactly. It's amazing. It's going to be yeah. a good time. That's, so That's going to be very easy. All yeah. right. Well, with that... Thank you one and all for joining us. Please subscribe to Gem's channel. It's not just this. It has loads of amazing content on there. Uh, and yeah, get the notifications for this each week. We do this this exact same time. Uh, next week, it's all going to be about the Unicorn, the A7S announcement. And uh, have a fantastic week, one and all. I look forward to chatting with you then. Good night. Bye, everyone. Good Take night. Care.